Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, in, so we heard about from Richard Bronk in the last session about how language and metaphors shape our actions. And one of the key metaphors of the 18th century was the invisible hand of the market, which was invented by Adam Smith to express the idea that markets flourish through, through the pursuit of ind individual self-interest. In the next session, we're going to test that theory. Um, a, a lot of you probably don't realise that economics actually started in, in satire. We associated with accounting and so on, but it's actually a, a liter it, it began in literature. Uh, and there's a very good reason for this because what satire does is it takes someone's grand theory, usually a politician's, about um, what motivates us and how we should behave. And then it follows those principles uh, to the letter to, and sees what happened. And if it's, a false, um, if it's a false theory, then that's exposed very quickly and it, it turns to ridicule. This is what Bernard Mandeville did, who was um, the poet who introduced the idea of the pursuit of self-interest uh, in a poem called The Fable of the Bees or The Grumbling Hive. Um, and he was followed by other satirists, including um, uh, um, Jonathan Swift, who um, uh, uh, wrote um, a modest, uh, an essay called A Modest Proposal, in which he he's, uh, suggested that uh, the problem of poverty in Ireland could be solved by eating the children of the poor. It's a completely repellent argument and completely convincing. And so uh, to debate uh, what's wrong with cannibalism, I've asked one of our foremost satirists, Jonathan Biggins, and foremost economist, John Quiggin, to uh, uh, investigate this, pr this principle. Well, yes, good morning. Is John Quiggin there? I can't see him on I my am. screen. Oh, there he is. Well, would you like to kick it off, John? Oh, good question. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll see if I can start. So I'd like to... Uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, lovely land on which the lovely building you see behind you is, is based, the Tarrabal and Darragher people in, um, in Brisbane. And yeah, so, um, so maybe um, Mandeville first, and, um, and he presents an argument which certainly has not, has not gone away. Uh, and so his, 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 his Looking very specifically at the way vice, as it was conceived in the um, at the time, uh, uh, primarily the vice of luxury and extravagance uh, contributes to the general well-being. And so his argument, uh, boiled down very simply, was uh, sure. You know, speaking at the end of, I guess, the 17th century, with when the Puritan the Puritan ideas were still around, sure, what everybody should morally do is dress in sober clothes and live quietly and uh, and not waste money uh, but then what will happen to all the tailors and uh, luxury good providers and all of the um, all, all the people who depend on them uh, to keep keep the uh, economy going and the fable is the bees are uh, the bees are uh, instead of consuming their honey are storing it all up and uh, and eventually the bees are all out of work and and so the uh, and so it, so, because people behave virtuously, um, they uh, they all uh, they they end up in poverty, and we see this essentially for an argument for almost any kind of ill-advised public expenditure uh, uh, that we might care to say. If you say, "Look, I don't like the idea of uh, the Grand Prix, which was just cancelled," you say, "Look at all the all the hotels that we've filled up by um, uh, by people coming to stay, and look at all all of these benefits." And so, it's it's a uh, and so it, that's uh, a satirical version, of course. Um, what Smith goes on to say, Smith is, uh, is um, obviously a much deeper thinker than Mandeville and a more complex one than he's often portrayed. So his primary point, he has a great quote, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and baker that we expect our bread and meat. That is, we're not, we don't go and say, look, I'm hungry, I would like you to give me uh, a nice loaf of bread. You say, here's some, Here's some money you can exchange for something, and and we get the and and we get these good things as a result that people people by acting in their own self interests in the right kind of social structure uh, in the right kind of structure right kind of social structure uh, produce the best produce the best possible outcome produce at least an outcome that works in any case. Uh, importantly, Smith's other great work, the theory of moral sentiments, 
uh, cuts against this notion of, of unconstrained self-interest. This, this, his story only works in a society where people basically play by the rules uh, and, and are motivated to act more or less honestly uh, within a legal structure, for example, that works. So he's by no means the kind of anarcho-capitalist, but the kind of people who wear Adam Smith tie pins would, would typically, uh, uh, would typically uh, suppose. So, but certainly what we see is an answer, answer to a question which seems, um, uh, seems at, various, at various times incredibly paradoxical. How can this chaotic system where everybody is just out looking for themselves produce any kind of coherent outcome? And the answer, the first answer is, is that the price system actually does this. Uh, everything else in economics really is arguing about, well, how much does it do it? What else do we need, both in terms of how we understand how individuals are acting, uh, but also what kind of social structures we need when this kind of thing doesn't work. So maybe toss that. <coughs> well, I, I think, I, I don't know if I'm quoting correctly, but I, my favourite description of an economist is someone who can tell you tomorrow what should have happened yesterday. And I think there is, um, I mean, that I always find science and economics in the same sentence slightly um, unusual. <laughs> But I think with the Mandeville thing and the, the notion of the um, virtues are what keep, it, keep us alive, vices are what make life enjoyable. I think they're inseparable uh, and certainly inseparable in, in a modern economy. And it's um, not so much the principle of selfishness. Um, it's just the fact that uh, the way human society is structured and, and, and one of the interesting things about reading these two pieces is how little has changed or how we have this kind of boomerang effect where we're going back to that uh, inequality of wealth. And I think this is something we didn't really discuss in the last session is mm. I'd be interested to know why there has been such a rapid acceleration towards um, an imbalance of wealth on a greater scale than we've ever seen in history um, due to the technological revolution. That's probably another a subject. Um, so I think that notion of, you know, don't necessarily practice what you preach um, is what keeps the machinery of the, of the economy going is as true now as it was then. On the SWIFT proposal, uh, it seems, yes, a, a ludicrous idea. But then you, you look at some sort of modern equivalents in the sort of creative disruption that we've seen lately. Uh, and I, I see a similarity in Airbnb. Um, where the motion was that you monetize your family home. Now, traditionally, the home was sacred. It was the hearth and it was the place that you had. Um, but then someone came up with the idea, well, you can monetize that and you can make money by selling part of your home to strangers uh, on a nightly basis. And then that accelerated to, well, you could buy a whole house and put that on the market for strangers. Until we get to this absurd situation where we were recently touring to Orange in regional New South Wales. It has 364 Airbnbs, uh, but no one can rent a house there um, because the disruptive, creative disruption to the market has already, in the space of a few short years, um, got to a situation where someone like Swift could not contemplate the speed with which that could uh, upset the equilibrium uh, to that extent. And I find similarly with something like Facebook, uh, where we have one man, one individual, owning the controlling interest in a company that has over 2 billion subscribers. Now, he has more power than any person has ever had in the history of the world. He knows more about more people in the history of the world than anyone. How could Swift even begin to um, contemplate a situation like that? And also Swift and Mandeville had the advantage of when they were being satirists, there weren't many of them around. Now there's a million of them. I mean, everyone's a satirist. Uh, and, and would Swift now have to express his ideas in TikTok? I mean, is that the way it's going to be? I mean, the, the, it's an interesting sort of dilemma. And you, you look at the, um, the model proposal and you think, yes, I can see the satirical point and it's beautifully written and argued. And that is true. Um, if you extend the rules of economics and policy, you will get an outcome like that. And yet in other less perhaps uh, extreme ways, we see those same patterns being played out now in, in, um, in business and entrepreneurial 
exercises and the way the, the tech revolution is going. I mean, the fact that uh, Jeff Bezos has been able to concentrate so much wealth and power in such a relatively short space of time. Uh, it's interesting, there's been a transfer from the traditional sort of guardians, you know, land, landed wealth, the gentry, the clergy, having the power. But the power is still there, it's just shifted into different hands and the hands are getting fewer rather than larger. Uh, so I think um, that was the sort of initial take I took on those two stories. I'll maybe jump right back to the beginning with your quote about The Economist and point out, as with the doctors who used to be, men in white coats who used to be on TV ads for medicines of various kinds before they were stopped, the people who play economists aren't on TV aren't economists. So in fact, uh, in fact, the economist is the person, certainly in relation to things like the stock market, who will tell you uh, there's no possible way of predicting what will happen tomorrow. Uh, in, I think, Norman May's great phrase, well, the stock market is an interesting position today. It might go up, it might go down, or it might stay the same. And um, uh, indeed, so at various times, I've seen physicists come in and announce with great pride that they've discovered that economists can't predict the stock market, uh, which is something we all economists know, but so that's a sort of just a very minor sort of point. We're just going to jump back to Swift and say the interesting point about the satire is uh, he was writing, I guess, around 1700. Um, 150 years later, uh, a million people starved to death in Ireland while the country was exporting food. So every every day during the Irish potato famine, ships would load up with wheat and beef and uh, at, at Irish ports and take it, take it for sale to England uh, while the population was starving. And uh, that aroused in many ways less outrage than Swift satire. And, and that's, that's something which says something about society. I'm not, it certainly says something about the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, capitalist, not, not exclusively capitalist, the social structures allowed this to happen, which said, you know, you, if you didn't own land, you had to pay the rent. Uh, and if you couldn't pay the rent, you starved. And that's, so that's, I suppose, a question about satire that's that the real world is often perhaps beyond satire. I, I guess I'll, I'll jump back in and say, yeah, what we see now is really, although of course, as you say, the, um, uh, the places where the big money has been made has been changed, but looking at, uh, at Piketty's book, which is interesting because a uh, capital in the 21st century, because it looks back at 19th century literature as a major source of explaining what's going on in the world. It's really uh, the world in which the older members of this audience grew up that was the exception. Historically, at all times and places, with the exception of a few decades after 1945 and a distant past when nobody had anything, uh, the world has been divided into a tiny number of haves and a vast number of have-nots. And, and um, uh, that uh, that yeah, you know, that pattern has been um, well, that pattern was broken uh, for the thirty years, the, the glorious thirty, as the glorious as the French called them, uh, up to nineteen seventy that was being discussed now, uh, discussed recently in the last talk. Uh, it's now returned, uh, returned with a vengeance, and um, uh, that's undermined in turn a whole bunch of stories. Economists used to think of a story where. Uh, where this was a natural tendency that the economy would first become unequal as the robber barons, the, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers got rich, then that would be spread in a, um, a trickle down or rising tide lifts all boats kind of fashion and society would become more and more middle class. And of course, uh, uh, that just hasn't happened. Well, what, if, if I could just ask a question, I mean, if, it could, if economists are framing the narrative and um, imagining a future, what was their failure to anticipate that there would be a swing back to the robber barons and the unequal wealth? Well, so, um, you know, this was discussed previously. I mean, the Keynesians, the Keynesians had a, um, uh, the dominant group of Keynesians anyway, had a, a fairly sophisticated but mechanical view of the world. And so if you, if you uh, delve into the trashier reaches of, but prominent reaches of science fiction, you know, there's Asimov has this, idea of social science, the psycho historians who can plot out the future uh, with high probability using statistical techniques. And Paul Krugman has a column somewhere where he says, you know, 
that's what I wanted to be. Why well, I went into economics, I wanted to be a psycho historian. So you know, they use metaphors like fine tuning, that we could get the economy, this complicated machine, and we can make it work for the benefit of everybody. And in fact, um, coming back to the computer point, then back to 1960, uh, and you know, I think uh, uh, the back rooms of Melbourne, uh, Melbourne University Economics Department, you can find an actual hydraulic model of the economy, really with pumps and pumps and outlets uh, where uh, Bill Phillips, one of the great genius of the profession, built uh, what was then called an analog computer. So it wasn't, didn't have digital chips. It actually was physical, which was a, th a thing at that time, which was actually model this. And all that failed in the late 60s and that brought back uh, the Hayek and Keynes, the Hayek and Friedman group who'd never liked this stuff back into prominence. But with, generally speaking, with the belief that they could keep on delivering the goods for the majority of people uh, the way they, in the way that had been done in the past, uh, uh, in, yeah, in the post-war period. So no, nobody really anticipated this happening and they kept on denying it until relatively recently, denying the actual growth of this wealth and then saying, oh, well, at least we still have lots of opportunity. And now I think um, opinion, you know, faith in that stuff has died, but, but nothing very coherent has come to replace it. And it's that, I mean, I often, do marvel at the, at the paradox of the so-called democratization of thought um, that the internet was supposed to give us, um, widening of opinion, getting rid of the gatekeepers, um, allowing everyone a chance to participate, whereas it becoming apparent to me that the reverse has happened. Um, we've got rid of a lot of the gatekeepers, but we have even fewer. Um, and I think we realized too late that the gatekeepers had some value um, that editors, uh, whatever you would like to call um, aggregators, people who actually looked at something before presenting it to the wider world. Um, is that something we could have avoided? Um, and is I that something... I, I guess I'm not a... I, I guess I don't buy that, really. I mean, I think... Um, I think you look at... You look at... You look at... I mean... Um, you look at the world and has been democratised in that way, not necessarily always in pleasant or comfortable ways. I mean, you look at Twitter, which I'm on, and you can certainly see, hey, you can certainly see plenty of unpleasant behaviour because it's people. Uh, but I, yeah, I find a lot of hypocrisy in, for example, the yeah, very off, slightly off topic, but in the gatekeeper, the the, yeah, the gatekeepers, or well, the people who work with the gatekeepers, journalists, for example could happily write a Jeremiah denouncing some person, possibly a quite obscure person, with 100,000 readers, and that person had essentially no redress. Now, the journalist does that, and next day they see 10,000 Twitter followers, Twitter, 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 Twitter likes for post denouncing them, and they think, oh, this is really terrible, who are all these thousands of people saying, uh, Saying this, and essentially, this is the always the reaction of the aristocracy against democracy. It was great, great when they when when they could issue they could issue the denunciation, and their gatekeeper would filter out filter out the responses. Well, I would then pose the question: Having had these systems in place for quite yeah. some time now, I think you know you could say 20, 30 years, perhaps, of the so-called democratization hmm. through technology. Uh, why has the shift to concentrated wealth been inexorable and the wealth has not been democratised? No. Uh, well, and so what we have, yeah, sure, what we have is we've got this system, uh, but there are a set of, yeah, we have gatekeepers who are, who primarily set themselves, as it were, as ticket clippers. So what, I mean, uh, they have different views as to what stuff they would, they, they may or may not have to allow or, or censor, but uh, the um, uh, Zuckerbergs and people like that, their essential job is to say, you can have this democratization, but uh, we're providing the platform and every time you look at it, you'll have to look at an ad and we will, yeah, we will uh, collect the revenue from those ads. And, and they don't take very much. In fact, when you look at how much they get per, uh, you know, per user per minute, think of, think of how much you know, people spend on Facebook, maybe an hour a day for 2 billion people, 2 billion hours, um, 2 billion hours a day, uh, they're only paying quite a small amount. But of course, if you, if you, if you have that monopoly, you, uh, you can get big money. So the answer really is that we have institutions that favour 
Uh, they've played a monopoly that have let Facebook buy out its potential competitors, uh, that create intellectual property, which means that, that uh, you can't copy this stuff. Uh, and so it's really the way in which we've handled things like intellectual property that, that have produced, uh, produced, part, produced that particular subset, but combined with the continuing impact of the financialization, which goes back to the 1970s, that when the Keynesian, when the Keynesian business fell to bits, uh, the finance sector came along and said, we can do this much better job, much the same kind of story as, as we said last time. We've got the computers, we have these marvelous risk reduction technologies, we can deliver the prosperity, just pay us immense sum of money and you will see the growth happen. And for a while, I say in the 1990s in the US, that actually seemed to be happening. Now it's not, and we're seeing, I think, the reaction against both those groups that even 15 years ago, looking at the US scene, which is where these things are set, both, uh, both Wall Street and big tech were seen very favorably, both by Democrats and Republicans, and now they're, they're seen largely as the enemy by both. But but they power. I mean, I think in, in some ways it's it's almost like it is a Swiftian, uh, the idea of taking a, a, a theory or a, or a proposal to its extreme. Hmm. And we're seeing the same thing happening now with the way big tech, and when I use the word gatekeepers, I don't just mean editorial gatekeepers, hmm. I mean controllers of the power. Yeah. And I mean, that that's what I find is the irony and the paradox that the controllers of the power have contracted, hmm. they haven't expanded. And it's, again, an interesting thing of, um, you know, even using the hive uh, metaphor that the, the drones, we the drones, tend to react in pretty similar ways. And the fact that so many people have gone onto Facebook and never questioned the notion. I mean, and here was a system that, if you look at it from a, you know, a cynical point of view, was specifically designed to appeal to the addictive personality of the human psyche of the human brain. And this is a stroke of genius on the part of the creators, that you create a machine that people think, my mother, for example, she's got about 12 followers, she likes to share photos. Yeah. And I like to do that and I can do it with my friends. I don't read the ads or they don't get any money out of me. Well, I'm afraid what you don't realize is it's the cumulative effect, the cumulative power. And then taking it to its logical extension as the Sapphires would, we now see a system that will influence and alter democracy. It's not just altering the market, it's altering the political structures of the, you know, of, of most of the Western world and the Eastern and the non-Western world, the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is now something that we really have to think, this is where the economics of a product or the economics of a creative disruption is working at an exponential speed unprecedented in human history and is beginning to alter the very way that the whole society is structured. And you would then have to ask, have we created an economic model that is now out of the control of anybody, uh, including legislators and politicians? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, as I say, there's, there's the finance sector, which is, is a whole story in itself. I mean, looking at the cultural part of it, again, I, I mean, I'm, I will push back against, against the kind of idea that, that it's really Facebook that's the problem. If you, look at, if you look at the bad stuff, that if you look at all of this stuff uh, and then look at, uh, look at Fox News as the first arrival, really that's, yeah, it's, it's really, yeah, Fox News is much more central to uh, the sort of challenge to, to challenge to a, a previous, uh, a previous sort of notion of a, a broadly shared cultural space or whatever you want to call it, uh, that was enforced by things like the Fairness Doctrine in the in the US. Um, you know, that that created something which uh, was perfect. Yeah, did a pretty good job of being addicted. That is, people sitting yeah, long before we wrote about being addicted to the internet, people were sitting in front of the TV for hours on end, absorbing the same kind of ramped up stuff. Yeah, and for that matter, listening to talkback radio and things like that, they seem to do the job of, of hitting the reinforcing stimuli pretty effectively. And, um, and so how that's happened is a complicated story, but I, don't, I, I, I think the, uh, all, the, all the rise of social media has done has been uh, to make this more visible and make things more visible that were previously hard to see. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, 
you could argue that Twitter is talkback radio with a much bigger switchboard. Hmm. Um, but it's funny that it basically falls into the same dichotomy of opinion. Uh, I find these, these systems are interesting in the polarization of opinion. It was meant to be create every color of the rainbow, uh, every shade of gray on the spectrum. But now increasingly the debate has just simply become black and white and very few people can even meet anywhere near the middle. Hmm. Uh, and the other thing is that Twitter as a, as a platform, and again, Swift would be rolling in his grave at this, 60% of the tweets generated in the US are generated by robots. Well, that's, uh, yeah. Um, now, that is not a system that is human in scale, nor human uh, in, its, in its effect, I think. Mm. Uh, and it's, the frightening thing is, I, I like, I'd like to compare the Luddites of the Industrial Revolution. I think the Luddites were much misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think they recognised that this coming revolution was a threat to their way of life. And they were yeah. accurate, man. It was. And it did destroy their way of life. And they weren't fearful of technology. They were fearful of the social impact that technology would inevitably have on them. Mm -hmm. Now, as it turned out, in again taking it to its logical conclusion, the Industrial Revolution has had many benefits, many, many benefits. But the ultimate end game is climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the end game of the digital revolution that is happening exponentially faster than the Industrial Revolution. And does anyone question it? And I, I think there's been quite a bit of, not a craven surrender, but I think amongst, especially amongst arts practitioners and cultural institutions, there has been a surrender to the digital revolution that has been swift and complete. Uh, and I find it odd that much of our cultural policy at a artistic level is now being dictated to by social media platforms, social media systems. And we are finding artists increasingly in the position of self-censorship um, before they even begin to do it. I mean, I was, it's interesting, as satirists, we were told by the artistic director of the Sydney Theatre Company that we were no longer allowed to portray non-Caucasian characters. Now we were playing Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. Now I would have thought we were punching up to power, mm. two of the most powerful people in the world, but it was deemed that it was no longer culturally acceptable. Now I find it extraordinary that satirists are now being told who they can and can't offend. Um, I would have thought the point was largely to offend anybody if you thought it, if you deemed it as an artist within your responsibility to your audience and you knew where that boundary was drawn and you would make that judgment. But now we're being told by management before we even get to that point, simply because they are fearful of the backlash from the mob. And you can arm a mob with pitchforks or iPads, there's still a mob. Uh, and that's the sort of, they're having an inordinate, I think, effect on the direction we're taking the debate, if you can have a debate anymore. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I'll push back very quickly to say, yeah, uh, it wasn't that long ago, it was certainly within my living memory that uh, you couldn't see the F word. Oh, yeah. The F word pronounced. I mean, I, I think, if, I, I, I guess I don't see any long term trend here. It's only you know, the, the impulse, the desire to treat some, some things unacceptable and try to push against that is more or less constant and it's only a question of what's acceptable and what's not. I wanted to go come back though to what's happened with you know, the digital story and say I think there's a big, I mean there's two things, there's, there's a broader point which, the positive point which is uh, the import, that information wants to be free. That, that is once I have, yeah, you know, once I have expressed an idea, the idea is for everybody it's like uh, like the magic pudding. You can cut as many slices as you like, and the pudding is still there, un, unimpaired. And in an important sense, the uh, the rise of the internet has made that more true. So I could I could write a complicated book, and in, uh, the book could be printed. Of course, the the printing press massively democratised things for both good good and ill. Uh, but but it still cost you fifty bucks to buy the book, and you had to go and find it, and you had to order it from Black Horse or in the UK or something like that, compared to uh, the text is all there 
uh, easily accessible, and I don't and compared to some of the other compared to some of the other arts, uh, this has been a lot that the, the the impact on text has been absolutely liberating. There's there's no you're not you're not that you're you're not you're, you're not, you're, the, you're not losing anything much. Now the kind of people who worry about digital stuff. Reveal, yeah, reveal themselves as really more caring about the, the feel of the paper and things like that than about than about the content of the text. And and so this, I so so I suppose that's just a lot of confusing stuff. But this question of we have the, we have information, it wants to be free. We ought to be in a world where where this stuff was was more free. But in fact, uh, these guys yeah you know, have managed to insert themselves in the process uh, by providing it. To be fair, by providing a slightly better service, which appears to be free. Uh, so, so, sure. And I think, I mean, I think that is inevitably, in, undoubtedly, true for the consumer. I'm not sure that it's so great for the artist or the writer. I think, um, I mean, musicians, for example, their mm. their livelihoods have been shattered by mm. Spotify, Apple Music, um, copyright. I don't know how long copyright's going to last. Uh, it, it's only through the goodwill that we get any sort of copyright pay but if apple with its market share remember when google books they wanted to put every book well, on there and i suppose the offer you were given was dreadful well but the part of well i mean i suppose part of the problem is it's intellectual property more broadly more broadly defined that is generating these massive accumulations of wealth and so in the sense to the extent that we uh to the extent we accept copyright as as a way of um as a way of financing creative activity, uh, we are definitely complicit in in the effect in our own oppression. I mean, that's uh, I mean, it's easy to say. From you can see a university behind me. I have a university salary. I can just write my stuff. But yeah, but the bigger point is uh, that's an, alter an alternative model uh, for any kind of, of creative or inventive work is prizes and grants and salaries as opposed to sales and copyright. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I struggle sometimes with, um, I mean, it's interesting talking about, as we're talking about the price effect of culture and, and the way that cultural policy is largely dictated to by people saying, oh, you can bring $2 million into the economy if you put this yeah. show on, or you can bring, you know, a blockbuster exhibition will bring that now. And I see the economic um, multipliers of doing, say, for example, live theatre, if you walk into a show and you see the restaurants all around full, you know they're your audience and you think, oh, that's great. We're multiplying the economic effect. But I, I, I mean, I know we should have grants and I know we should have a monetary support for the arts, but I always think the greatest support a government can give the arts is to put the arts on the agenda and to give it the importance and the integrity uh, that it deserves in the argument. And I think that's where Keating was quite good at that. In fact, traditionally, Labor governments have given less to the arts than Liberal governments. I mean, this is ironic. Mm -hmm. But what he did was he put it onto the agenda. So it became not just a monetary thing. Mm -hmm. It became about the value and the importance of it. And for me, the best way to support the arts is to find an audience that is willing to pay for it. And that's where I would rather and I know it's difficult in some in some arts, and you can't have that all the time. But I think we—I'm not quite sure what this has to do with Swift or Mandeville. But um, I think, for me, being a theatre practitioner, I am just grateful that um, it ends on the—it works on the uh, fairly straightforward principle: you pay your ticket at the door, you come in, you see it, you go out, and that's it. Uh, and I think it will be ultimately the greatest irony is that when the live performing arts are the only ones that can make any money. And I, I look forward to that day. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think, I think there's a whole, I mean, as you see you know, information in different forms and what's essentially it, you have, have this once off, you have had that live idea. I mean, going, I mean, going way off track, if you look at, all the shows, I mean, Doctor Who is the classic one that the BBC just wiped during the 60s. And it wasn't really to say, you know, because they, because tape was expensive. It was because the assumption was the show had gone to air. You might test your audience's patience by repeating it, yeah. 
during Christmas we complain, look, we're getting shows we've already seen, why, why we want this? Um, yeah, so, so there is that sort of once-off uh, once character of some experiences versus, I guess, the, the, uh, the natural tendency of the writer is to think, you know, maybe in 2,000 years' time people will still be reading my work. Uh, so the idea of infinite rep reproduction and uh, that, that aspect of the information economy, I think, is much more appealing to writers maybe than to, uh, than to uh, some other creative activities. Mm. I mean, and do you think, uh, I mean, was, was it a failure of the narrative or a failure of uh, modelling that we didn't see that the technological revolution would actually funnel the money into fewer hands? Um, well, I suppose it, it's important to remember this was really, I mean, the, in a very narrow sense, the technological revolution helped, uh, helped to build global finance. But this tendency was really, I mean, that this 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 really could have been done. All, all of this, all of the all of the first phase of the growth of inequality, which is the financial sector, could have been done with 1860s technology, with the transit layer. If you say, I want to sell, yeah, sell every share, yeah, sell my entire shareholdings in Australia because I think that tomorrow is going to be a bad day, and I'll buy it back the next day. You could do that with a telegram in 1860, uh, provided you, you couldn't do it at all in 1950 because. The communications were there, but but the control was said. Look, I'm sorry, you you can't do this. Uh, we're a sovereign country, and we yeah you, know, you can't just come in and buy and sell whatever you want, and you certainly can't have all these absurd financial instruments that we haven't checked out. Uh, so so it's important to remember most of this stuff was happening uh, when the internet was still the province of starry-eyed idealists. So the huge the big growth in inequality in the in the US, which is the leading economy, started in the 80s. Um, uh, it's only the different people have come to the fore in the yeah, the contraction of the economy where uh, where people get immensely rich while, while other people didn't do so well is definitely a pre pre internet phenomenon and so is uh, the in fact the recreation of a partisan media I and mean, we can all complain about uh, we can all complain about how partisan the media is but you can go back to Washington leaving office. And you can read quotes from the anti-Washington paper saying that there have been some terrible, disgraceful rulers in the history of the world, but who, who in this terrible history has been worse than George Washington? Uh, the vilest, you, know, you had incredibly partisan press back in those days. So what we, what a lot of what we're doing is convey, is comparing a normality, what seemed like a normality we remember from you know, the childhood of people of our age, the you know, 1950s and 1960s, there was actually, you know, the real question isn't why have these things happened? It's why was something else possible? And what, why did we, why, why were things so different in those 30 years than, than ever before, ever since? And can we recapture the good features of that, of that period, bearing in mind that it wasn't all good? Oh, yeah. I, I constantly have to say, again, to my mother, oh, over the days of World War Two, you think, seriously? <laughs> I don't think the world was such a good place then. Uh, I mean, and people have forgotten, you know, the Cold War hanging over us. But getting back to the Mandeville uh, and the Fable of the Bees, I mean, I guess you could look at the internet as a hive that is largely built on vice. Um, and it would not, the bulk of it is, I mean, I always find it interesting that the first website to actually make yeah. money was pornography. Yeah. It still constitutes the greatest part of um, transactions on the internet. You look at things like TikTok, Instagram, it started out with such a great, with high hopes, nice photos of the sunset and photos of your dinner. And now it's been taken over. Well, of course, Facebook bought it, but it, it is increasingly being politicised. Um, and you find, I think, the whole, well, certainly the social media section of the internet has been infiltrated and politicised to a point where the vices are way outweighing the virtues. Um, now, Mandeville would say, of course, well, that's, that's a good thing because that keeps the whole thing bubbling along. But interestingly enough, the generation of the wealth is concentrated and going, it's not trickling down, it's trickling up. Mm. Now, yeah. how, do, how do we get to the point where the economic model is essentially a trickle up model? Well, as, as I say, I'm just going to say it again. That is, that is if we excised the period after World War II from your memory, uh, the question would be how, how, how the question would, wouldn't be how did we get here? The question is 
yeah. Why did it take us so long? Oh, no, well, the question would be rather something like, the world has eternally been like this. Yeah, did God make it this way? That's what, yeah, that's what the hymn book says. The, 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 the rich man in his castle, the beggar at his gate, God made them high and low in order to their estate. Without that 30 years, the assumption will always be, well, of course. Of course, some people have all the money and everybody else doesn't. Well, where does that put our romantic metaphors in the romantic economist? Well, um, I mean, the romantics, for all their good points, I mean, when Carlyle was attacking the dismal economists, he was attacking them because they opposed slavery. Mm. Uh, so, um, so the romantics, uh, yeah, the romantic and, and all the sort of medievalism of the romantics, again, wasn't... Yeah, it was, certainly wasn't an appeal to the downtrodden poor. It was more that they they liked the ruling class of that day, who basically got there by killing people, better than the ruling class who got there, yeah, of their own day who got there by uh, employing them at miserable wages. Mm. I mean, I, I find like the gig economy. I, I find mm. that a, a I like the term because I mean people sort of think this is in some way liberating, uh, and I always found it interesting that the gig economy was given a, a, a credence and a credibility because it was a, attached to an app uh, and that there was a, a notion that in some way you were becoming self-employed it's it's the way that Howard successfully turned um, you know the battler into the aspirational uh, and once the working class was elevated into the middle class they then became the natural constituents of the Liberal Party because they were small businessmen um, and the same with the gig economy but I look at the gig economy, I think, I can see no difference to the hungry mile. Yeah, oh, I, I have used precisely that, precisely that comparison, I must say. But I think I would say I, do, I don't buy that the gig economy is a positive description. But what it replaced, uh, the same thing, was called the sharing economy, which tried to over, yeah, tried to over, yeah, with, things like, um, uh, with things like Airbnb, which tried to overlay what was essentially, as you say, a recreation, the hungry mile and labour market, uh, with this touchy-feely stuff, which we had, which you know, people had hoped for, uh, but which the gig economy supplanted. Um, I'm going to come back to Airbnb and say, I mean, it started out as this sharing economy kind of story that you rent out your couch, but all it's boiled down to now is an unregulated hotel sector with an app. There's no, you know, I mean, if you say what's, you know, I mean, you could say, you say, okay, you go to Orange and you can't, can't rent a house, but you can't, yeah, because they're all hotels, and then you say, well, what happened to you know, Jesus and Mary and Joseph when they went to Nazareth? The answer was, yeah, the hotels were all full. And... But they were full legitimately because it was Christmas. <laughs> yeah, very good point, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, that's right. But so, so, no, so certainly I think the gig economy, at least in the circles in which I move, is used entirely as a pejorative. Um, mm. And... and um, um, and so, and, and uh, so, so I think it, it does, and, and it, I suppose it comes to a broader point, which is, I uh, come back to the Luddites, is that it's not the technology, but, but the interaction between the technology and society. That, you know, there was no reason why, uh, you know, why the invention of a, a machine should have made people worse off. And indeed, in the period when, yeah, in the, there was plenty of technological advance in the in the glorious 30 years. The productivity grew massively, and everybody benefited. But you know, uh, people at the bottom benefited more than people at the top in that period. And the same with these kinds of developments. It's it's the society uh, created essentially by the 1970s and and therefore by the financial sector uh, that has um, uh, that has meant that things that should be liberating are in fact the opposite. But I guess as artists, we should be asking the question too. The Industrial Revolution used machinery to replace physical labour. Yeah. The digital revolution is gradually replacing intellectual capacity, creative capacity, mm -hmm. the mind. I mean, we haven't even begun to think about artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, yeah. deep fakes, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I wonder, should we be ringing our alarm bells a little more loudly? Should we be the canaries in the coal mine that should be pointing out that things are rapidly moving beyond our control we've already seen um, our economic grip move out of our reach um, with the concentration of financial power if we get the concentration of it's not even intellectual power it, it's 
I, I think the, the digital revolution has the capacity to have a terrible impact on the individual's ability to think and create. And once you move into the realms of artificial intelligence, and I know people, are, you know, we all saw, and, and the, the 19th century poets and the intellectuals saw the ill effects of the Industrial Revolution and, and there was much written about it and all that sort of thing. But I, I think people have, I could be imagining this, but I think there's a, not lulled into a sense of, a false sense of security, but I, I, I find that if you question technology uh, in, in that sort of way now, people I think you're being alarmist or a Luddite or you're not moving with the times, you're not accepting the new realities. And I just wonder as artists, should we be actually saying, I don't think this is such a good idea. And even if you trace like TikTok, what is it down to now? 14 seconds. What's the next TikTok? Seven? What's the next? Three? Uh, and the way that TikTok operates, the, the, the fact that it can track your eyeballs as you're watching them to determine the algorithm to decide which one it shows you next. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone keeps seems to think, oh, yeah, that's just a bit of fun. You know, Chinese data gathering exercise aside, um, do you think we should be, and even economists, you know, we should all be saying, hang on, guys, let's have a bit of a rethink about this. So let me, let me go back to the 19th century. I mean, there's two kinds of artistic reactions, I think. Um, you know, there's, roughly speaking, say, the pre-Raphaelites and, and let's, let's turn our eyes away from this terrible stuff and go back to painting pictures, painting Ophelia and the river and this kind of stuff. And then there's Oscar Wilde in one way and, and um, Morris, William Morris in another, saying, Here's, yeah, here are these machines, yeah, let, let's actually turn these things from the, the brutal, brutal things they have there into something, something liberating. I mean, Oscar Wilde more or less just a, a much more, a very simple version of the argument is roughly, look, if we could get this economic machine under control with social, a combination of socialism and industry, there'd be loads more time for all of us to write plays and go to plays and hang Leisure out activities. interesting young uh, persons of whatever gender and all these kinds of things. And, and but William Morris, saying, you know, let's not, let's not reject these tools, let's make beautiful things with them. And, and it seems to me that's the, that's the correct story uh, uh, yeah, for, I mean, I don't want to prescribe for the arts, but it's, um, there are opportunities there to, to turn this around and to use it in self-critique and all these kinds of things. And, and I think they're, they're there. And I guess I'm, I'm, I am going to just, defend Twitter at least, which is the only social medium I, I really use, which is roughly an automated version of what blogs were when we had when we first started blogs, which is here is a short state, short observation on something uh, on something I saw today, which is of interest and you can link to stuff and things like that. And I mean, we sort of reinvented long form blogging uh, with these, which is very inefficient with Twitter, but, but uh, uh, we string a whole bunch of tweets together in it and produce an essay, which is rather sad. I think, yeah, I, I contrary to nearly everybody, I guess, find as long as I just uh, ignore the temptation to argue back at annoying people and just block them, I can have an interesting discussion. I suppose what I would say is, and yeah, you realise this by exposure to more people, uh, this idea of talking across the political divide was never true. Um, and so, so what I find is I can, you know, I have a political position, I can talk to people with modified versions of the same political position, I learn something. If I talk to a Trump supporter, I don't learn anything. I, they, and that seems to be just as bad. I think that was always true. It's just people didn't do as much of it. Um, I, might, I might break in there yeah. um, because uh, uh, we've, uh, it's 11.50. Um, uh, and uh, um, just, uh, uh, I wanted to ask a few questions myself sure. if I can. Um, it, we've, we've come through this period really from well, the 1970s where um, we've followed a, a kind of particular uh, story as, as we were saying with Richard Brock um, and it's produced a kind of dual narrative, one, one where um, uh, things are, are just dandy but for us in the arts it, it, it's, it, the story doesn't ring true and um, now the pandemic has thrown a complete spanner in the works and uh, um, uh, economists are changing their minds about how the economy works and 
and so we've reached a, a moment of change. And I think if we in the arts are going to be part of that change, if we're going to engage with it, um, uh, really our opportunity is in um, affecting those metaphors that we use. And so um, I wanted to suggest a couple of, of mine that would might uh, that we might be able to disseminate that might be um, alternatives um, that uh, people people can then use for uh, understanding the economy and communicating it to others. And um, the first one I wanted to ask you about was um, the way that we've been uh, kind of persuaded or habituated to thinking about the economy is um, it, when we talk about the economy, it, it, it tends to be shorthand for the business economy. It doesn't even take into account um, government and childcare and all those non-market driven aspects of the economy um, to which the arts is, is partially partially belongs. Um, but what the pandemic did was actually expose all that as the actual infrastructure of the economy that keeps it uh, ticking along. And you can actually close down the entire mm -hmm. business economy temporarily. And so long as you've got the social security and, and um, that non-market driven economy supported, then you can ride out the crisis. And so um, in the past, we've, kind of, we've, we've thought of, if you think of the economy as a cake, in the past, um, the business economy was the cake and uh, the non-market driven economy was like the icing on the cake and, uh, and we would pay for that if we can afford it. We'll pay for childcare if we can afford it and Medicare and all these things. And what the pandemic was flip that over entirely and say, no, 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 it's the non-market driven economy that's actually the cake and the business economy that's the icing. So uh, I was wondering what you think of that, that uh, metaphor. I mean, I, I like it. I mean, I think um, I had something in the office of my mind, which is now suddenly, uh, suddenly skip out of it. I mean, economists have lo spent a lot of time thinking about the household sector. And I mean, in many ways, what part of what the pandemic has done has shown that that and, and the rise of the internet has, has broken down a boundary which emerged with capitalism. I mean, before in an agricultural economy, the idea of saying, well, here's the household economy, which is where you sleep, and here's the here's the productive economy, which is you know the pigs out next pigs out out in the shed and the, the crop you have to walk walk to makes no sense. So that, that division has kind of changed. Mm -hmm. Again, I want to stress the guys who turn up on the TV are not economists. <laughs> um, they're bank yeah they're bank employees, mm -hmm. and their primary goal is to have the name of the bank. Mm. Like, uh, yeah, what they say is secondary. I mean, but of course they're bank employees, so they're not getting you know, what they say will be in the interests in you know, the, the mind, minds of the banks. But really, their their primary objective is to have chief economist bank X mm. on the news, as opposed to chief economist bank Y. Mm. Um, uh, so the pets so of they they carry that thing. So so in that sense, uh, yeah, the degree of focus on business is more reflective of, of the economists employed, the people employed by business as economists than people who actually do economics. And are they the economists who are advising government in that case? Because governments well, are the one that seems to really... Um, uh... um, and so, yeah, so I think, I mean, this is a sort of, yeah, if we, if we look at what's happened, and yeah, we had the story, which is correct, of how economists uh, had faith in the Keynesian model, which, and they lost it. Uh, the alternative stuff has been coming in for a long time. At the theoretical level, I think there wasn't, yeah, the pro-market innovation really stopped a long time ago. The last the big ideas were, were from people like Friedman and Hayek uh, and some other things around that time. And most of those people have been dead some considerable time. Um, so so it, it, yeah, we've seen, I think, at the theoretical level that questioning, but in terms of the way people think about it, I think the pandemic is the third of three three crises that have shifted this. The first was the big dot-com bubble and bust that the financial markets did obviously crazy stuff and kept on doing it. And we're seeing that, of course, again, with Bitcoin and things like that. And that undermined a lot of faith in the idea that financial markets knew what they were doing. And that was even more crushed by the, by the global financial crisis. And at the same time, the same time uh, governments came in and rescued, you know, governments came in and rescued things, the advocates of austerity got back control and made an awful mess of things. And we've seen this time round, you know, no one, no one has yet popped their head up to, in any serious way to say, you know, what we need now is austerity. You know, the Treasury is producing generational reports saying, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. uh, forget about this 
getting rid of debt stuff, you know, we'll leave it to our grandchildren to deal with, which used to be used to be the worst thing you could possibly say and is now just accepted. So so I think there have been these changes changes in um, have been these changes and I think within parts of within the parts of the government that pay attention to these things when they're competent, you know, areas like social security, people are paying a lot of attention to those things. I modulate the fact that under the current government everything has just gone. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, well, and not not even, I mean not that they are not that they have imposed a ruthless ideological agenda. They they're just in there and have no real clue what to do about anything, the pandemic or the economy or anything. I mean, as you mentioned in the opening remarks, the term economy and economist is a relatively recent one. Mm. I mean, the bulk of it, the economy is what it was once called life. Yes, um, and a, a, a national economy is is not a huge deal more than the aggregation of 20 million small yeah. economies. Um, so I think, you know, but like all middle management and like all things, once they elevate, once you put a label on it, well, then people can then yeah. address it. Yeah. Uh, I think the pandemic has accelerated mm -hmm. uh, what we were talking about earlier about the shift to the digital um, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and the wealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeff Bezos's fortune doubled mm -hmm. in the first year of the pandemic. Now, so I think that will we'll see a shift. I mean, look at us all on Zoom. Imagine if you'd bought shares in Zoom when they thought of it. Um, so that, that's going to be uh, obviously a major shift. But I, I think um, you, we'll have to try and rebrand the narrative. But, it, but it's very difficult. It's like with politics. Malcolm Fraser once said, politics shouldn't be on the front page of the newspaper. And I kind of agree with it, um, but everything is now political and, and, and everything, and you, as soon as you make something political, it's like the culture wars. The culture wars are only the culture wars because they've been designated as such. Mm. They're only continued because it is in the interest of one side, particularly, to continue that mm. brand, to continue to make those names. As soon as they find a name or a label mm. they can exploit, they leap onto it. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of it, if you want to talk about, you know, changing the advice to government or changing the way government formulates cultural policy or whatever, it's to find different labels. I've always wished we had a different label to the arts mm -hmm. because people, you know, their noses crinkle up as soon as they hear it. Mm -hmm. And they don't recognise that if they're watching Desperate Housewives or if they're watching, you know, mm -hmm. The Bachelorette, it's on the same spectrum as Aida. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's on the same continuum. But how you explain that to anyone? Mm. Uh, and, and the arts work in the same way. They trickle down, they trickle up. Um, so, yes, so, so um, yes, on that point, I've got a, a, another metaphor, which yeah. you know, if, if it really does come down to changing the language, and really it's about finding meta popular metaphors. Mm. Um, what we're talking about now is, of course, the national debt and how do we pay it? And that uh, economists kind of uh, uh, wring their hands over the, the terrible metaphors that we use to explain that, the, that the, the, the national budget is like any other household. We have to balance it. Um, but, no, uh, it's not. The no, household exactly. budget has to be balanced. The federal budget never has to be. Oh, who, right. remembers the, who remembers the Fraser Howard deficit of 81? No, oh, I, I know, but I mean, I how it works. So is what we need is a, a way of visualising yeah. it easily. And so, so yeah. what, sorry, John, are you? I was going to say, I mean, this is, this is the most bizarre metaphor, um, yeah, because, I mean, like I can see 20 people here. I wouldn't be surprised if collectively we had $10 million of debt between us mm. um, in our households. Yeah. Mm. The idea that household, yeah, the idea government should be like households, don't borrow to buy stuff. Mm. I don't know. Maybe my maybe my great grandfather's household was like that, but um, yeah. I, and uh, and if we leave the debt to our grandchildren, well, they can then leave it to their grandchildren. Well, I, I, <laughs> well, I we leave the asset. We leave the assets. Yeah, well, we leave the assets as well. Yes. Um, so here's here's my metaphor. So so what I want to suggest is that the um, the way national debt works is that. Um, uh, the economy is like, um, or money circulates through the economy like blood circulates through the body. So it's generated in the bone marrow, as I found out. And yep. that's like treasury, which uh, prints, the, prints the money or, or creates money. 
and it, it delivers it to the heart, which is like government, which then mm. pumps it, circulates it through the body. And as the blood circulates through the body, some of it is used up uh, through, uh, through labor uh, to become muscle. And that contributes to, the, to growth. And so when the blood returns to the heart, but you've actually got less than what you sent out in the first place, you've got a deficit. But the deficit is actually a good thing because it shows that there's economic growth happening. And the, the body's not in trouble because it can now produce more uh, red blood cells to, pump, you know, to you know, pump to the heart, which it can then recirculate. So, um, yes. These, these are quite, actually quite familiar metaphors. I mean, the typical ones that I say are, are hydraulic rather than bi biological. I mentioned though, you know, there is not that far away from you an actual model of the fluids pumping their way around the economy in precisely the way you describe. And going back to the 19th century, Marshall, who was the great you know, classical economist, uh, and many since have, have said we really ought to have biological rather than um, uh, rather than mechanical models of this kind. So, so it's, these aren't really, uh, I mean, I think uh, at least for economists who are in touch with the history of the discipline, which is, is only a minority I have to, have to concede, this, this, these are ideas which have a, a good deal of familiarity and appeal. Well, but, um, it's really a problem of, of, of culture and language because if you yeah. continue, you're trying to explain to 21st century economic students how the economy works using a 19th century metaphor of a, a hydraulic pump, then you've got to explain the, 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 the 19th century physics before you can then explain the economics. So Hydraulics yeah. work just as well now as they did in the 19th century. They still work, that's true. <laughs> I, was, I was going to say something which I mean just about the digital economy, which is, I mean, this isn't the first time, as I say, that people have been immensely rich. You know, Carnegie and Rockefeller and Henry Ford got very, very rich. The difference, I think, which, is, you know, which ultimately will be crucial, is if you ask, well, how did Henry Ford get rich? The answer is he made cars at lower cost than anybody else. He paid his work, he, paid, you know, he actually paid his workers reasonably well. Uh, every, yeah, you could look at the economy and roughly speaking say, everybody is getting what they put in. Now that's misleading, but, or what they produce, but Henry Ford, is, Henry Ford is producing cars. And we buy the cars and Henry Ford takes his bit off the top, pays the workers, pays the suppliers, all pretty straightforward. Uh, you ask, you know, what is Mark Zuckerberg producing? We're doing all the work. Um, all he's doing is, all he's doing is uh, collecting the data, you know, collecting the data which, which we, uh, let him collect, well, because we're unaware of it, and sell that data to somebody who then uses it to sell us ads. A and there's no, you know, there's no correspondence between the contribution and the and the return. So the people who built the internet, who were basically university academics in their spare time, got nothing for it. Mm. It was people who came in and worked out a way, as I say, to clip the tickets on the way through, uh, that um, uh, that. Uh, uh, they've become rich and, and that I think is going to be an important fact in undermining the um, in undermining uh, the social license it has already been undermining the social license of, of the of the of the economy is that that when you look at the people who got rich you say well what is it that these people have, have actually done and it's very hard to see that that you know, they seem to just have been in the right place at the right time where a big stream of money is flowing past and they're just scooping labels out labels out having having got that position and i think that's part of the reason why why it's been so uh why why their uh, political position has eroded so rapidly i mean and one of the other beautiful ironies of mark zuckerberg is that he now sells the data to governments and economists yes. so they can predict future behavior yes yes um, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing i like bruce petty's um machines hmm. i don't know if you remember the cartoon yes, yeah. yeah uh he used to do fantastic machines sort of heath robinson yes. contraptions to try to explain the economy <laughs> i think they probably are as true now as they were then um listen thank you jonathan and um thank you john um I, you can keep talking through this next bit what what harris has asked me to do is to for the next sort of 50 minutes or so, just open things up so that, um, you know, people can ask questions of you two, obviously, um, but also make comments. And perhaps there is a sense in which 
um, you know, Richard's talk this morning and your talk now are really just, you know, kind of two acts of the same drama, really. Um, so that, that's, I'm going to try and do that now, invite people to kind of say their bit or uh, ask questions of you. I, I, I've got a few ways of perhaps framing, though, uh, what, what you've just said. And I just want to return now to something that, John, you said, which is, um, you know, don't ask why did these things happen, but, but why was something else possible? Yeah. Um, so um, the sense of possibility, um, uh, if you like, what happens next? Um, I think that that might be, I mean, that's always a crucial question. Um, uh, but it's a particularly crucial question now. Um, and um, when, I'm, when I'm working in the theatre and I'm working on new, new drama, um, I, I, I sometimes say that there's a huge difference between a play that doesn't work and a play that will never work. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, on the whole, <laughs> you want the first rather than the second. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, I know that when you're living history, it's a kind of very poor position from which to judge it. Um, but many of the things that Richard talked and you two talked about today, um, this morning, um, obviously it's all happening all at once. Um, ideas, technology, and so forth. Um, uh, they, they don't neatly separate themselves out so you can judge them one by one. Um, they're just like a big mud bowl that, that, that arrives through your living room um, door. Um, but we have to decide, I think, um, collectively, um, which are the ideas that we're going to hang on to, which aren't always the most prepossessing ones. So I, what I take from what you've said, John, particularly in relation to Twitter, but it might also be true of social media generally, is, is it the social idea behind it that has gone wrong, or is it the technology itself? Because, um, you know, those kinds of distinctions, and that's just one example, that would be a distinction perhaps between something that you've just got to let go because it will never work, and then something that you can reform. So out of all the things that we've just been talking about, you know, if you like, which are the ones that we're going to kind of pursue, <laughs> try in the belief that we can make them work, even if they don't work now. Um, and then which are the ones uh, that we're going to let go? And I, I noticed with Richard this morning, there was very little uh, talk about kind of, well, some of these ideas are just, they're just bad. <laughs> um, but I, I think perhaps there are one or two, particularly in terms of the financial speculative instruments. Um, I, I think the club of people who think that they're good is probably a little bit smaller. Um, and then the, the last thing that I would say, and it perhaps goes back again to what you just said, John, um, about, um, you know, kind of periods of inequality in human history, kind of vastly outnumbering those periods of equality, is that I, I was thinking about my own experience as an undergraduate in politics and economics at a time when the new right was just on the rise. In fact, I found myself using that phrase the other day, the new right, and having to explain what it meant. Yes. And, I, and I realized, boy, I haven't used that for a while. It's a bit like a pair of trousers you take out when you're just like, mm. wow, I wore those in my twenties, but never since. Yeah. Um, and, and so I was, I was, I guess I was hanging around with people who were from the new right. I didn't really understand that at that time. I didn't know what my own politics were, but they knew what their politics were. And, and they were pretty kind of vocal. At no point did they talk about a return to inequality. <laughs> in fact, no, in fact, the reverse. For, for, for them, it, it, was, it was a way of spreading the wealth. This was going to be a form of democratic capitalism. Yes. I remember that so clearly, even though I was drinking much more beer than I should have been, and probably thinking about theatre rather than the economics I should have been thinking about. What a mistake in my life that was. Um, uh, but but I so I just think that the, it's interesting then for us to have a think about um, why this divergence between what we did and what we said we'd do, mm. because that that does seem to me to um, to affect um, not only the results of you know kind of economics and by did everything else because of course we're only talking about economics because it's the it's the lingua franca of, of public policy, it's, it's what we have to talk about if we want to talk about everything all at once. But it also returns to Harriet's concern with language. 
Um, because when you have a, or when you're in a situation, and again, it's kind of familiar from the rehearsal room for me, where you know that what's in front of you is just basically a lemon. You have to create a kind of language of, um, well, almost a hypocritical language, really, in order to persuade yourself you're doing the right thing. Mm. So I, I've got a feeling that that might be something that people in arts and culture are particularly attuned to, mm. uh, which sometimes goes by the by the, the the name the hollowing out of public policy language or, or things like that, and which may have um, its roots in that. So those are just my framing remarks. And um, now with that, I'm gonna kind of put on the big view so everybody, well, we can see everybody and just invite everybody to talk all at once. Or <laughs> more importantly, to ask John and Jonathan questions first, of course, but also then to make the comments that we've had to hold back while we've been listening to other people. If I could, if I could begin, I can, going to the idea of the mechanical um, metaphor. I can like to remember at Newcastle University in the late 1960s, there actually was a machine yeah. um, that, that replicated the economy, complete with valves and pumps and water flowing through it, and people demonstrating what they could do um, by sort of turning off credit or, in, or increasing the monetary supply or whatever. I, I, just, I, I just mentioned that as a recollection, but my, my question uh, really relates to the digital economy and the internet and everything associated with it in that it has expanded the availability of cultural material and intellectual material and political material and ideas to the point uh, far greater than any other time in history. But the one thing we don't have more of is time. And the fact that time hasn't expanded to match this expansion of of um, abundance in, in, in uh, material, I'm just wondering whether that is in fact one of the contributions where, where people, uh, where we find culture and politics and ideas being increasingly atomized and dis disaggregated. Um, well, could jump in, I mean, what, uh, there's a whole lot of economics about this, which is the attention economy, namely, uh, time spent looking at stuff is scarce and 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 that's yeah that's essentially what the tier clippers and the digital economy are, are after is keeping you looking at their stuff in order that they can serve you up uh, serve your ads and um i am um, you know and and so and in, in important respects there's an ongoing struggle indeed between the consumers or the, you know, all of us and and the advertisers, which have been going on for a long time, of us continually trying to look at stuff without having to waste time looking at the ads, and them trying to force force the ads on us in one way or another. And that 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 scarcity of time is really the uh, is is really what 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 uh, uh, what that's reflected in. And as I say, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing particularly digital about it. Both these fights were really fought out uh, with the invention of the video the video recorder, was which, which I mean is kind of a digital technology, but no, it's analog. So uh, yeah, it was, is it okay to record the, the Saturday night movie on TV and then, then play it later, skipping through the ads and uh, the industry saying, no, yeah, you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. And that fight one way or another has been played out uh, with wins and losses on both sides, but with enough wins for the Zuckerbergs and people like that to get them in and the Google owners to get them into the record. Yeah, um, thing about time, I don't know if you saw that uh, they'll soon be able to advertise to you in your sleep. <laughs> um, Alexa and Siri the assistants, the networks that now exist in their millions um, in America. Um, uh, what they do is they've devised a system where they, they say certain keywords during the day and then at night, these things automatically make your association with what you heard during the day so you will dream favorably <laughs> about what you've just heard now i'm not making that up that is actually beginning to happen they can do that amazon doorbell which everyone thought oh this is a good idea there's a little camera on your doorbell and i can look on my phone and i can see who's at my door when they're delivering a parcel last month any owner of the 
many millions of these things in America, was given a week to decide whether they wanted to opt in or out of Amazon's ability to create a sub network that linked all of these together as, a, as another internet, essentially. Um, and then if your internet went down, your little Amazon keyhole would borrow the signal from the one across the road and it would borrow the one across the road. So essentially Amazon had a surveillance network at their disposal that covered virtually all of continental North America. Now, all were got it wrong. Big Brother is in private hands. It's not in public hands. It's not the government that's been following you. Um, and I think the notion of time, I mean, how much content can we have? How much content do we want? Uh, and the interesting thing about the demise of free-to-air television, I, I can't see free-to-air television in this country lasting another five years. I don't know how Channel 9, 10 and 7 can keep going. Uh, and then that, that, that comes down to the cultural definition of what we want our culture to say about us. Because essentially, you know, they can try to get quotas on Stan and they can try to get quotas on Netflix. It's not going to happen. They have too much market clout. And eventually what we used to define as not necessarily just our dramas, but even just the shows that we watched collectively that kind of gave a, a broad rough definition of what it was to be Australian, they're getting fewer and fewer. Uh, and that's just going to be the, the, the model. And it's going to be, again, controlled by fewer and fewer people. And, and the cultural hege hegemony, is that the right word, um, of, the digital of the digital giants will dominate more and more. And they just keep pumping it out. And frankly, it's like, what was that old song, you know, 300 channels and nothing good on. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I don't, I don't know how you solve the time conundrum. And I think also, if I, if I could just say something about Twitter, I think it's a bit disingenuous to say that Twitter is simply the sharing of interesting information and, and articles and you know, news feeds. There is something about, and this is where the technology interfaces with this, the idea behind it. The idea is good, but the technology allows it to be warped in ways that it, and everyone always goes, oh, the printing press, that just did the yeah. same thing. Well, it took several hundred years before there were a million books in the world. Mm -hmm. Now it takes half a second before there are a billion tweets. And that, that statistic about 60% of the tweets generated in America are coming from robots, that, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not actually getting a human exchange of ideas. You are getting a human exchange of ideas that is manipulated by the technology as well. So there is a technological aspect that comes into that. It's not simply people wanting to, you know, read Playboy for the articles. Um, so I'm going to push back because I'm in on base. <coughs> Dude, please push back. Uh, and say, yeah, you know, all this nostalgia for when there were three channels. No, no, I'm not talking about nostalgia. But you guys kind of mentioned that there's this collective stuff. If you go to the book world, it was 200 years ago, somebody saying, of the making of books, there is no end. I mean, it's always been the case in all of our lives, we can see the, see the shelves here, that there wasn't a question of which, you know, there, there wasn't a question, there were, there were certain books that were popular, there was no sense in which you could ever go into the office and say, I read chapter X of such and such a book, what did you think about it? You know, we always had the idea that if you wanted a book, you could go to the library and there'd be a cornucopia of books out there that you'd watch and that 60 or 80 or 90% of them were total trash. Um, yes. But... And, and I, I, I guess I don't, I, I, yeah, in turn, yeah, I, the, the, issue of how, the issue of how do we support the people who write these books, how do we get Australian books that speak to us, hasn't really changed just, yeah, just because one particular set of levers is no longer there. Can I, can I change? Well, the I think it has. And also, if okay. I could just say, a library, a library of books, if you collect yeah. 10,000 books, that library does then not determine which books you're going to read. Mm -hmm. It doesn't shape the narrative of what books should be taken out of the library. Twitter does that. Mm -hmm. Twitter actually shapes the discourse by algorithmically deciding what's going to be put to the front, what's going to be put to the back. I mean, every time you pay Google to raise you in the search, that algorithm is doing that. When you watch TikTok, the algorithm decides as you watch it, which video you're gonna watch next. Now you could get all the books in the world and put them in a the library. They're not gonna suddenly collectively do that. 
So I think it's quite a quantum leap into the way um, information is disseminated. Could I, could I change the direction <laughs> properly, just on the question of how are we going to pay the authors and ask, is the universal basic income the answer? Well, I mean, I, I'm certainly a proponent of a version of the universal basic income, which is the level of income guarantee, which would include a basic living standard for artistic and creative work. So uh, it differs in the sense that you don't give it, you don't give it to Jenna Reinhardt and try and extract it back through taxes. You only expand the expand the uh, provision of basic incomes. But yeah, we could do that, and that would provide. Uh, that would provide a basic income to anybody who wanted to devote themselves to to creative work, and that that I think is something we we could and should do. And could you explain how it works uh, for uh, those of us who haven't uh, come across the idea? Yeah. Well, essentially, it just just it essentially takes what we have now and says well, we first do a little back to the future and say we'll go back to 1993 when the unemployment benefit was roughly speaking the same as the age pension, something you could actually live on and and put that put that back in place, and then you say in, instead of instead of these incredibly onerous compliance conditions designed on the assumption that people are are cheats and throwing them off the system, we're going to expand what we consider to be a a contribution to society beyond the, beyond the uh, make it broader reflecting the fact that we can afford to do this, uh, and that includes things like volunteering or, or creative work. Uh, potentially a grant for somebody setting up a small uh, a living standard for somebody trying to set up a small business uh, making it accessible to many more people uh, but essentially just by without without radical change to the current system in the sense of if you just said just said to the department of social security instead of finding reasons to throw people off benefit off unemployment benefit uh, find them something they can do so that they can stay on if they want to and, and and the pandemic really was that um, the thing that made that possible because not so much because uh, uh, our circumstances changed, but it just demonstrated that um, if you do pay uh, something that's approaching a universal basic income in the form of JobKeeper, yeah. that it does actually it actually creates yeah. economic growth. It doesn't that it doesn't the, the national increasing the national debt isn't a disaster. Yeah. It's, that's right. Can I jump in there, Harriet, just so I think that you think this is really important and just ask what everyone else thinks of that. I think that's a key point for you, isn't it? It is, in this it, is it is rather. But... Or do you think it's unviable? Or you just think it's oh, just it's... such a political non-goer? Non, yeah. non well, like, is it, it's only the, um, it really is the only politics that stands in our way at the moment, isn't it? It's, it no, it's not. It's with respect. Uh, this has already been tried. The idea of a universal of a, of a basic income for certainly performing musicians, of which I am one, in places like Holland and uh, to a degree in France and some of the Scandinavian countries, and they basically, if you got your qualifications as a musician, you signed on with the government as a, an official musician. And you would get paid money every year and you'd have to probably produce, you know, three or four pieces of music or whatever it was. And uh, people lived happily ever after. But that's all collapsed now. It's gone. And it's not coming back. It's certainly not in a place like Australia. There's no way that an Australian um, government will allow artists to do something like that. And um, the other thing I wanted to say, which was in... To, as a performing artist, um, how to survive. Mm -hmm. And my, I'm, the other thing going back to what Harriet said earlier about improvisation being a sort of metaphor for how to survive in this economy. I've been an improvising musician for over 45 years in what used to be known as the gig economy before there was the gig economy. And uh, so I think uh, the issue for performing musicians is one very simply I agree with everything that's been said about, you know, the digital deluge and the sort of gloom and doom of everything that's going on right now and the destruction of the possibility for musicians to earn a living. That's something that the, the nail in the coffin was the, the pandemic, of course. But before that, it has been going downhill for 20 years. It's been a disaster. So um, the question is how to survive. And through various, so I'm 70 years old now. 
I've survived as a musician from Keynesian economic situation to, to through the sort of Thatcher Reagan situation to now. And this is because I think I'm an improvising musician. I've been able to survive. And basically I'm the sidebar, you know, whenever I look at any situation, whether it be the opera, the orchestras, stadium rock, whatever it is, I'm, I'm the sidebar. And the, the answer to, to survival for me has been to stay on the sidebar actually. If anybody, I'd like to interest what Jonathan Biggins has to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you say you've been in the gig economy. I've been a freelancer yeah. all my life as well. And that's why this I, I recognise. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not ideal. Uh, and so many people who are not equipped for it and who don't have any financial nous at all really suffer. Um, and I've been lucky, but you've had to cast your net very wide. If I was an actor sitting by the phone waiting for a job, I'd still be unemployed. Um, so you have to go out and create your own work. And, and that, you know, this bloody pandemic, not only did it kill everything last year, I was just about to do the show up in Brisbane and uh, lockdown. A week, cancelled, gone. Now, yes, you can get it back later, but that's a week that you're not going to get back. And I think that was the terrible irony, particularly for musicians. I've got some muso friends who, they had a residency on Heron Island for three months of the year, and that basically gave them the money to live for the year. Well, that's knocked on the head. They've tried to do the online thing. They've tried, you know, cap in hand, going, trying to get patrons, trying to get whatever. It just doesn't pay the bills. Um, there's just not enough money in Spotify, Apple, whatever you want to try to do on, online because people, it was introduced essentially as most people resent having to pay for things online. Um, YouTube has just blown all that out of the water. Um, and I think it's, it is very difficult for people. And then they could see the glimmer of hope with live performance because people were coming back to that. And then that got knocked on the head. So I, I, I agree. And having been in the gig economy, it's not great. Uh, and for people who, you know. Well, it, it's, not, it's not great. It, it wasn't great, but it was survivable. That was the point. And now but that's taken away too. Yeah, but the benefit of us being in the gig economy and, and for performing artists, it's always been that is that un un the non-monetary value of what we do, the creative value of what we do. But if you're delivering pizza on an electric bike, you're not going to get a lot of joy out of that when you get paid just six bucks an hour. Mm. Um, and I think that extension of the gig economy, it's like uh, Uber taxis. Someone said, oh, it's disruptive technology. Is it? It's mm. the same experience. You get picked up by a car and you get dropped off in that car at another yeah. point. What's changed is the method of payment. Um, and it was a stroke of genius because you didn't have to pay the people proper wages. Mm. Yes, you I, made them a, a contractor. I, I see it really as, as a return, a return to slavery, really, because you know, the definition of slavery is that you, mm. you, you have a <laughs> work. And that's what the gig economy has done by removing all those, those um, uh, government regulations that protected you, that allowed you, that gave you the independence to say, I'm going to quit this job. Mm. I just want to come back to something was said, I'm not sure, about impossibility. I don't think Richard talked about the imagination. And I think yeah. if anybody had described five years ago the world we're living in now, and not just the pandemic, but um, Trump as president, the Liberal Party announcing we're going to run deficits for the next 30 years, mm. all manner of things, um, yeah, no one would have believed it. And so, so I think... I think, I think the view that anything is impossible, uh, you know, is is a mistake. I mean, there are points in history when really stuff is stuck and isn't going to change very much, but but this isn't one of them. It, it does seem but, to me that a, a universal basic wage or some similar kind of um, uh, project is inevitable because um, th this isn't going away. I mean, we've we've got a lockdown now in Sydney, and the job keeper uh, support has been withdrawn, and so uh, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, something like that needs to be reintroduced. And this isn't going to be the last crisis we go through. So to me, you know, the, the, uh, the world has become increasingly volatile. Its financial markets are becoming increasingly volatile with things like the global financial crisis. And you know, um, environmentally, it's becoming more volatile. So 
I, I can't see that there's any alternative but for government to start introducing something like this eventually. John, Rose, yeah. um, I think someone asked a question on the chat. Why did the system collapse? Um, um, well, be basically because uh, the market economy has, 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 has wrecked havoc with so-called you know, social democracies in, in Europe. I mean, these models were set up after the Second World War. That, you know, the, it's something that we don't quite understand in Australia because we're halfway between the American model and, and the European model. And we had some government um, input into making or helping the, the arts evolve and, uh, and, and survive. But, um, but the European model of, which was set up, which was basically arts are good and everybody agreed with it. I mean, democratically, arts are good. Yes, we like them. Yes, it's good that we use our taxes to pay for them. I mean, that's just gone. And, he, and I, I, I don't know, I have no um, statistics for it, but I guarantee if you went around asking people in Germany or in France whether they were prepared to put, you know, substantial amount of their money into the arts, you would have fewer people saying, yes, this is a good thing than was maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, progressively back to... If there ever was a golden period, I probably missed it. But like the 70s and 80s are often thought of in terms of like where the arts were strongly subsidized and they were meaningful to the most amount of people. And now they are not. So I, even, you know, left leaning people in Europe are also not saying anymore, I mean, politically I'm speaking, uh, that the arts are good for us. They're saying, yeah, there's a, there's a price tag. And the price tag for something like performing arts, like music, I mean, clearly everybody expects it to be free. That's just what, uh, yeah. And I, I, just, I before I finish, there's, so there's one model, which is kind of, in, I'm talking about the survivability here. One model, which is interesting in Sydney, which is, a, you know, it's an obscene real estate kind of uh, horror show. Um, and uh, so the places where you can actually play music, particularly music, which is not popular, um, there are almost no places left. In the 70s, I had a choice of 20 places where I could just for free go and play and create the door, make my own publicity, get on with it. Now you cannot do that. But there's one place in Sydney where you can still, and a, a guy, I'm not going to mention his name, but a guy, a friend of mine, he owns fairly, you know, he's, 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 he's inherited money, let's face it. But he makes his place open for music to take place. It's called the... Um, People's Republic, and it's in Camperdown, and it works uh, on, a, on a very simple level. He's not allowed to, to charge, you know, it's, it cannot be a public venue, because if he did that, he'd have to pay public liability. All the musicians there would have to pay public liability, and the whole thing perhaps. So it's just, he, people go in, they know that, that what's going on, there's a jar, and people put money into that jar for the musicians. And it's, it, you know, people put 50 buck notes in there. Can I throw something in here? Yes. Your comment about the People's Republic sort of spurs me on. It's a bit of a tan tangent to what is central to most people here, as I understand it. But is that there are other systems, of course, outside any market economy for most of the arts practitioners around the world, including in the increasingly important states of China and their um, acolytes. And the way that artists exist there is is in multiple forms of course increasingly there is private support for them there is of course government support but it's not an, a way of thinking that is that is um, central to what we're discussing today and I just wanted to throw in the thought that there are such a diversity of cultural practices in this world that we have to keep in mind anyway I was thinking earlier about sort of people, I think Jonathan said about people paying for tickets and going to mm. see things, an awful lot of practice around us, Indigenous practice. Mm. Um, mm. In Indonesia, Wayan practice goes through the night, people come mm. and turn up and then they go mm. away again. It's not, this is very significant cultural performance mm. in our lifetimes and it's another way of thinking and mm. I just wanted to throw in that mm. it's a, um, it's there and we, sh we go down our own little rabbit hole if we're only thinking in one way. But well, no, that's not central to what most people well, would be thinking here. Well, I'll throw in another spanner here. Why should we be paid at all? 
I mean, I, I think this is part of the current federal government's response to it because Scott Morrison, his mum and dad started an amateur theatre company, an amateur musical company. In fact, his father directed him as um, the Artful Dodger in a production of Oliver. So either something terrible, faggot, something nasty to him in the dressing room, or it was a bad experience. But I think it's shaped Scott's approach. If people are going to be creative, well, doesn't that satisfy the need for creativity? If people choose to do this and then people, other people choose to go and see them, and if someone wants to be a musician, now putting aside for the fact that if you want to be a top-notch artistic performer, and it, uh, it takes discipline, but you could, uh, you could ask, why should they be paid at all? Well, this is the importance of the, the cake metaphor that says, uh, you know, the, the funded arts are part of the cake, not the icing. You know, if, if you no, want... but I would say they don't need funding at all because people want to be creative, they'll be creative. And, and the, the, the noble amateur, yes, I but... think, is coming back into fashion. Yes, but, but the, the idea of the, um, of the cake <laughs> um, is that uh, it's actually performing a function in that what uh, um, it's doing is actually maintaining stability of, in the economy. And, and actually, this is what... Um, uh, our, our last speaker of the day, Astrid, is going to talk about um, that what the arts does in a crisis is actually maintain social cohesion. And what we found in the pandemic was how essential that was, because we had all these people at home. And it was really, you know, when you think back to the, the very beginning of the lockdown, it was a very frightening time because we didn't know if we were all going to, um, uh, you know, conform, if we were going to comply with government you know, instructions. And if you, if you don't have a compliant populace, you can't govern. So, you know, what the arts did was basically, um, it was, a, um, you know, you had the, the doctors there and, you know, kind of keeping us alive and, and you know, the firemen putting out the bushfires and doing all sorts of stuff. But the arts were there keeping everybody together. And that, that, you know, that we're all in this together thing was very much to do with people um, connecting through creativity. So yeah, but, I think there's a very strong argument for saying why should artists be paid is because they're an essential service. Yeah, but then the argument also goes that people are going to be creative anyway. Let them be creative. They'll do it of their own accord. And I, think I, think miss, I think we're missing something. Uh, the uh, present government, I think if you did a survey, I think you'd find that they actually hate the arts. Mm, <laughs> I, I think that's true. I mean, pretty well all of them. Hate the arts. Not all and, of them. And the more extreme the arts get, the more they hate them. But doesn't that go back to the point about what are the arts? I thought that was a very good point. You know, like it's the bachelorette as well as. Sure. But 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 but, it, but anything that that uh, it doesn't you know pass the uh, the famous pub test um, is going to be hated. If it was redefined. But... If there was a redefinition, isn't that one of our failures? Is that we go along with this idea? And I've heard a lot from bureaucrats in Canberra that the arts equals opera and ballet, mm -hmm. full stop, you know, and that's not for us. We haven't broken that down at all. Mm -hmm. I, no, I agree. It, it does for the politicians, though. That, that's what they what think of the arts as. They want to go and get their plum seat at the well, opera. They're going to do any arts. Again, again, our failure, isn't it, that we haven't sort of argued that better. John Sanger, your turn. Oh, sorry. Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, look, to bring together a couple of things and going back to what Larry said about time, because one of the, th one of the things that I've become um, uh, concerned about just over the course of this discussion is that w where are all the products of a post-Australia Council culture? <laughs> what is the arts? The arts is what the Australia Council classification says we are. And we are responsive to that nature of what is the, 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 the sponsorship culture. Um, one of the things, to go back to Larry about time, is the fact that when I speak to my nieces and nephews in their 20s, they have choice. They make choices. They are tech savvy. They are on all the platforms, but they make choices. A couple of them are in the arts. And they are actually making choices about how they progress without funding. So I'm wondering whether, in fact, there's another thing about generational approaches to how we actually perform, how we actually engage in art forms, and how we actually receive art forms that is actually really pertinent to what the future is. How are we going to exist? We, as, as post-60s year old people, 
belong to a certain culture that have achieved some sort of success in our careers and have managed to pay our bills and so on because of the nature of how we grew up in the 60s, 70s and 80s and so on. But kids who were born in the 90s and going into the new millennia have come into a completely new and tech savvy environment. And I think they're making choices that go directly to this, that are in a sense, um, um, well, certainly the people that I'm talking to in my, my nephew's generation are actually making choices about their career in the arts that enables them to actually um, uh, 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 exist, to survive, as Ross was actually saying. They managing to, to survive their art form because they're engaging in other forms of activity and other career choices. And the only other thing that I wanted to say in this discussion too is that, you know, up until uh, up until the Australia Council, and certainly in the late um, 19th century, we existed as a commercial enterprise. Audiences paid um, and kept commercial managements like J.C. Williamson alive in order to support the art form. Now, when I look at a post, um, in dismay at a post-COVID uh, opening in the theatre, my only choices in seeing product in Australia in terms of musical, for example, were either Hamilton or American product that is actually taking the audience dollar and shipping it off mm. door. So the vital money is that we're talking about in circulating in the, whether it's a, a hydraulic or a body metaphor, mm. is actually being blooded out of us. So it's not returning to the economy itself. Now, there's a huge compilation of things that have come in there, but I think the important point I want to make, though, is that younger people outside our generation are making much more informed choices about how they engage in the art and certainly how they engage in technologies. I think the only thing we can do, John, is move into administration. <laughs> <laughs> the just, one growth in sector is in the arts. Just to pick up on John's point, I think that's, that's right. People are making choices, but I think to go to what Jonathan was saying earlier, increasingly those choices are being governed by algorithms, mm. uh, which are funneling people to particular things. But I also want to pick up on, on Jonathan's point around why pay the artist of all, at all. I think the risk of that um, is you could end up with a situation similar to the parliaments of the 19th century, when the only people who could afford to be members of parliament were those who had private incomes and, and had the, and as a result, had the, the freedom and the time available to serve in parliaments. And one of the, um, one of the uh, advocacy positions of the Chartist movement and, and the like was to pay politicians as much as people might popularly resent that today. Similarly, if, if in fact, the only people who were to engage and take the view, don't pay artists at all, um, because they'll do it anyway, increasingly fewer and fewer people will be able to afford to do it. So as a result, the arts will once again come into, um, once, once again be, be dominated by people who have the private incomes to enable them to do it. Um, the other thing I want to raise, which concerns me greatly, is the extent to which artists themselves are increasingly um, having to invest in the creation of their art. And I know Jonathan talks about being a gig, being in the gig economy, and if and if he didn't create his own work, he may not work. But increasingly, the people who are least able to bear the risk of doing creating art or creating live theatre uh, are the people who are increasingly doing it. And one of the consequences of the pandemic is I have a friend who was about to open a show for the, for the second time. It was, it was going to open it last year and it, was, it had to be postponed. If that show doesn't go, go ahead, then his small independent theatre company will stand to lose around 20 grand. And I think, I think we're not only talking about in terms of artists' incomes, it's not just a question of artists' incomes, but it's also the source of investment mm -hmm. for people to engage in the arts. And I don't know whether there's been any research done on the extent of the invisible investment 
of the artists themselves. Oh, yes. It, and actually, mm. to come back to the, the question of why pay artists at, at all, I mean, of course, that applies to most of the non-market-driven economy because there's plenty of doctors who would do the work even if they weren't paid, nurses who would do it, childcare workers. You know, it, it actually applies to, uh, you know, by definition, to all that non-market-driven economy. But I, I guess it falls into two things. Is there, there's the value of creativity to the person who is creating it, and then there's the value of creativity to the people who consume it. Mm. Now, if we say, or we're arguing that creativity on an individual level, is that more important mm. than consuming creativity? <laughs> is it more important to be creative and to satisfy that urge? And on that level, you don't have to be paid for that. But if you wish to consume creativity, then someone is gonna be paid for it. Uh, and that's... But I think you could say the same thing with, with doctors, um, where you know, we have the problem with Medicare, where people need their GP, but they're not willing to pay for it because they can't afford it or, or whatever. But um, we don't all need to be doctors. But the current thinking is no, that we should all try to be creative. No. Mm. But doctors do, some doctors do need to be doctors. That's what they will do, and they'll do it without payment. So, um, and the, the, the danger is that if you don't pay the doctors, then medicine will collapse or you'll only have medicine for the rich. And, you have, and that's the same that Larry was saying about the art. Uh, you know, if you don't pay arts, then the art will collapse, you know, sector will collapse and you'll only have art for the rich. And what we found in the pandemic is or, that we need an art sector because we need to maintain that stability of, the, uh, you know, of that social cohesion. Or you'll, the, you'll um, have sorry, art yeah. for art's sake and for the, each other's sake. It'll be art, creativity done for you and for those immediately around you. Now, there is value in that creativity, mm. but mm. we're talking about the value of creativity to the people who consume well, it. Can, That's I, can, I, can I volunteer? <laughs> I'm just thinking about the film and television where the, I get the bulk of my work. Um, I think that if we stop paying the artists in Australia, then... Uh, almost instantly, we would be completely dominated by foreign products, mm. and no one would make anything. Um, oh yeah, but does does the government have to pay them? Mm. Just a, a point well, thing coming back to the liberal income guarantee. The other aspect of that, which we haven't had any progress on for a long time, is shorter working hours. I mean, the question of if you're going to do this stuff and make and make a living, how much time you come back to scarcity of time, and the fact is that. Uh, for many, many decades through the 20th century, we, we got more and more free time. Uh, if we, people who are full-time employed, uh, that's become, that, that progress in full-time hours has, has broken down, but also, of course, uh, uh, for both good, and, both good and bad ways, the arrival of remote work has sort of broken down some of it. It made it possible to work very long hours, but also potentially possible to um, uh, get your work done. And meanwhile, be, be writing your opera in your spare time, and, and as long as the as long as the work turns up, um, as, yeah, as long as you you can do you do your day job in the right time, you can do it. But but this issue, yeah, that, that kind of issue of of just creating space for people to do things, either in terms of having more leisure after after being employed, or through something like the income guarantee, is a way of doing this that leaves open as to what will be produced, whether people will, yeah do arts, do sports, or yeah, use the time to sit on the couch is, is, um, is something that we have to wait and see, yeah, we have to wait and see what, uh, what, what people choose to do and what choices are acceptable uh, to society as a whole. Um, Two words that come up in, in, in cultural policy and reading about cultural policy, um, and they're often seen as being antithetical, but not necessarily so, are uh, excellence and access. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the, you know, the whole Australia Council ethos is driven towards excellence, whatever that means. Whereas if you go to the local government level, um, there's a whole, in community arts, there's a desire to actually emphasise access. In other words, increase participation in the arts, which goes to what, I think Jonathan was talking about about people doing doing um, cultural activity for themselves and their friends. And within the city of Sydney, we we have a couple of creative centres where people can go and do things and make things and the like. 
but the problem but the thing is the more people participating in the arts uh, and creating for themselves means they have less time to go and enjoy or experience the arts created by professionals or people who actually make it, want to make a living out of working in the arts. Well, the, the, the I, of, oh, sorry, John. I'll just say I'm not advocating that the artists shouldn't be paid. I'm just <laughs> thinking that this may be an insight into the current federal government's thinking, is that if creativity is important for individuals, then individuals will create, and there is no need to spend government money on that. So the net benefit to the society of having creative active individuals will be there free of charge because what's wrong with being amateurs? You're still creating. It's only people like us who we get paid for it. Jonathan, I think there, there's, there's a kind of resistance there even when it doesn't involve any money. I mean, the, um, the, you raised the issue of, um, of whether a con, uh, you know, content requirements on streamers will be introduced. And, you know, first of all, I think if it were introduced, that would simply bring Australia into line with, with Europe and, you know, pretty much every other OECD economy. Um, so there's a good argument for, for doing it because everybody else is doing it. But, um, but secondly, um, it doesn't cost the government any money to do that. All they're doing is saying to the streamers, you know, well, some of that uh, production slate that you had in other countries, you now have to move some of it here. And that's all you've got to do. It's not going to cost the streamers anything. It's not going to cost the government anything. You know, the only reason the streamers are resisting it is because they don't like uh, any kind of production decisions being made for them. So they don't like conditions being put on. They like to have total control over everything that they do, um, which is understandable, but it's not going to make a big difference to anybody in the long run. But still, we find that, um, you know, two years down the track, they're still dithering over this, over, this, um, uh, over this issue. And the current proposal is to put a 5% you know, content quota on it, which is not really enough to even replace what we've lost through, um, uh, through, the, uh, through the content quotas on freeway television. So, um, you know, you kind of, so there's, it's, it's more than just a financial issue for them. There is a kind of a, a deep kind of ideological reluctance to support artists, you know, to support artists or the film industry, I think, in any way. But again, this comes back to an economic problem that uh, content quotas are seen as an impediment to free trade um, and they're seen as a tariff. So in the free trade agreement with America, one of the stumbling points was the, uh, the introduction of content quotas on, on um, film and television. But there's another interesting economic paradox in the Australian film industry. Technically, it should never exist. It never makes any money. Uh, the, the, making a, a film is the pursuit of finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. In fact, I, I think you could count on two hands a number of Australian films that have actually got their money back at the box office, and yet people still continue to invest in them in the hope that it might. Mm. So, I mean, the film industry in particular is, is a casino. Um, but, and, and I, I find it odd that governments actually, the amount of kudos, credit and money that is given to the film industry, when often fewer people will go to see an Australian film than will go and see a show at the Sydney Theatre Company. Yeah. I find oh. that extraordinary, but that's, that's a side issue. Of, you know, of late, um, it's certainly true that Screen and Trader has been, has been um, putting more of their support behind television than they have behind film. They, you know, they've, they've started to be really reluctant to invest in, in even in development of film sets and so on. It's, it's, really, it's getting very hard. Um, and that's certainly true. I mean, I, the, I, I'd say two things to that. One is that, the, um, that while that's very true of, the, of, of feature films, um, it's not so um, true of television, which is relatively well understood. And, this, this, and provided we could get a content quota on the streaming services, then I think there's, there's no reason why that business model shouldn't work, work at all. The other thing is that I think it's also true that, that feature films and television, those, those, all those platforms aren't converging. And even though the feature film industry is, you know, hasn't historically uh, been, you know, 
it's in a really financially viable sector. It's, um, uh, I think once you once you add the, the streaming services into that, and they start to invest, and particularly if there was some kind of requirement on them to invest in one-off drama, then again that would that would that would change the formula again. Um, but the other thing is that we simply haven't had enough. Um, we're incredibly wasteful of our talent in this country. That's a good thing for me. That you know, if if the government had invested more heavily in the film industry over the years, instead of instead of kind of e eking it out, so that we kind of so we're all just kind of barely surviving, but not actually able to practice our craft at, at an optimal level, um, then there would be then we would have a much greater proportion of films that actually did make money and you know did have international success and have a much more you know there are. There are plenty of small countries. I mean, you know, um, look at the uh, look at the Dutch. You know, uh, look at the film industry in the Netherlands. You know, um, there are lots of uh, small small countries like us around the world that, that do have film industries that you know that have a reputation and make money. We just haven't optimized the talent that we have in this country to do it. I've got a question for David Trosby. Um, we seem to have been having these arguments. Mm since I began in this industry 40 years ago. And it seems to be the same argument every time. And we always go to the government with the same argument and we get largely the same response. Why do we keep, the, why do these patterns keep repeating? And are the circles getting gradually smaller and smaller and smaller? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have to say, look, I do have a very strong sense, uh, Jonathan, of deja vu in this discussion because these are arguments that have been gone through gone around and around in circles and maybe the circles are getting smaller um i mean i think th th there's a lot of interesting material in here but i think that you know one of the sort of basic issues that you've raised is why do we have to pay artists at all to, uh, let them you know just let them do it um and i always remember the the the, the phrase that i i can't remember who said it um you know art, artists make art like chooks lay eggs um, you know, they just do it. And that's true. But then my response to that was, well, who, who feeds the chooks? And, and, and that really is the sort of issue that's involved here. I mean, I think the role of cultural policy and the role of, of government in this respect is to ensure that artists can do it. And, it's, um, it, and therefore, you know, it's, they're, they're not going to be able to um, survive and there's not going to be very much art produced if we do only just leave it to the individuals to sort of pursue their creativity and um, and that's fine and of course people do do it for their own pleasure and their own enjoyment and and we'd like to see more of that happening in society but i think for the for, the, for society as a whole i think there is a, a, a very strong uh, reason why we should have some sense of collective agreement that you know we we, we want to have artists we want to we, we don't want them to be starving we want them to be doing their stuff uh, we want, and, and I come back to the point that you made earlier about about the freedom of artistic artistic expression. I mean, the, the, the ways in which the whole market system has has closed down, and, and, and your 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 point about satire is is absolutely correct. I mean, that's that's something which is really really fear, um, you know to be feared about the way things are going. And governments have a responsibility to keep those lines open so that you know so that artists can say whatever they like. And art, and governments are often not the best. At doing that, I guess the government response would be, "Well, the people who buy the eggs can feed the chooks, <laughs> and when the chook stops laying eggs, that's lunch on Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you're probably right. That probably would be the government's response. I think it'd be a pretty, pretty ignorant one, um, which would be much as what we we probably expect from this uh, from this government. But that's 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 yeah. Look. It's, it, there is a role for just facilitating. I mean, you know, it's often been said that the role for government in relation to support for the arts is not to, not to dictate what happens, not to make it happen, just simply to facilitate the, the environment in which companies can happen. And it's true, you know, as you, as you know, probably better than anybody, getting a show together is, is not cheap, you know, and you can't just rely on people with their individual creativity to be able to do that. You know, you need the facility, you know, to, to have that sort of whole process facilitated so that it can happen. I sometimes think that cultural policy would be better spent, the money would be better going to the audiences than the artists. 
Yeah, there's a strong argument for that. I mean, it's been, it's been put uh, many times. Uh, they've tried that in England and, and they gave people, uh, you know, sort of uh, vouchers to spend at the Royal Court and they all spent it going to the movies and, and they didn't go and see the, you know, the sort of uh, um, uh, soul building things that they should have been going to. There, the, but, but, but it is a valid point. There is a, there is a reason for saying, uh, and, and this, is a very, this is actually a very strong point about stimulating audiences, generating the sort of, interests and so on, which, which can happen as a result of cultural policy. Well, I, I remember there was um, one, uh, who was it? Um, I've forgotten the, um, the lady who ran the ensemble theatre for many years. Um, Sandra Bates. Yeah, Sandra Bates had a favourite. Never got funding. No, that's, that's right. right. But she, had, she, had a, uh, she had a favourite um, theory about how the theatre should be funded and it was it was kind of similar to the way that, that, that films are funded in the sense that um, it was basically a ticket subsidy so that you would get a, um, a percentage if um, you would get a, uh, you know, a certain percentage if, you, if it was a new Australian play, if it was a classic Australian play, it might be a slightly lower percentage and if it was a foreign, foreign play, overseas play, then you might get a bit less. But basically, it was just a direct ticket subsidy and her theory was that, um, that that basically put you in touch with your audiences because the more the more successful the show was the more money you would get from the government um and you know and from your own audience try again. but you shouldn't work the opposite way that the less successful the show the more money you get from the government to encourage the well, uh, that's right, yeah. exactly that's right those sort of ideas have been promoted for the higher education sector yeah like a, a kind of voucher system and the argument is that, is that merely reproduces existing um socioeconomic yeah attraction right. to university so um you know it's i don't know i mean that's kind of all i want to say there i've got a lot of things i do want to add a bit later but um yeah i i find that i'm not convinced by that idea i, th I think it reinforces existing taste cultures and i think that one of the things that the arts as distinct from other kinds of culture, cultural practice do, is to mobilise people or change people's disposition towards things rather than just allowing them to sort of settle into mm -hmm. existing cultural practices. So I just think the idea of giving people to resources to reinforce their, their cultural preferences is, is a real dead end. Well, you, I you, think we have to balance that. Though. Though. You know, that there's nothing to say that you couldn't have a um, that, that the existing kind of Australia Council policies couldn't be continued at one level, but at the same level on top of that, you have a reward for, for commercial success. The advantage of rewarding commercial success is that um, is that you do put your put, you create an incentive to to get in touch with your audiences with with what they actually want, and you, you, there's a you create a baseline that would support your theatre sector. Um, I, I think I need to uh, break in there because it's, it's actually lunchtime now. So um, I think we need to come back at two o'clock and continue uh, this conversation. After lunch, we're going to have... Um, a, 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 a Julie and I are going to explain what the plans are for the future of Currency House and Platform Papers. And then we're going to hear from Astrid Jorgensen, who I hope will turn you all around on this question of what is the value of the arts to the economy and, and uh, how important it is to, uh, to uh, holding society together through the crises.